Hello, everybody. Um, just making sure that everybody's getting logged in. Uh, but it looks like we've got everybody, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Megan Foster. I am a program analyst with APPA. Um, I'm also online with Nan Benali, who's our tribal program grants manager. Say hey, Nan. Hi, everybody. So, welcome to maneuvering the jurisdictional maze when planning for reentry in tribal jurisdictions. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Hold them until that point, unless it's technical. Um, and there will be a handout and copies of the PowerPoint available once all is said and done. Uh, we're also recording this, so if you get logged off, whatever happens, you should still be able to have access. Sam? Hi. Okay. What we're going to talk about now is, is setting the stage for um, um, the reentry in Indian Country. But, so one of the things that we talk about here is how do we talk about this, pro this, this subject? And then also who is involved? Um, who are all the people that are invited to the table? And then there are those that are not invited to the table. And then the third part is the restorative versus punitive perspectives. And so when we talk about um, reentry, there's a way that um, some people in, I think, in um, tribal communities, we talk more from a restorative perspective as opposed to the punitive perspective, which is more, I think, some most of us are um, aware of. And so when we go to the next slide, um, we're going to first talk about the theory, the, theory of historical trauma in um, for American Indians and Native Americans. Um, so when we talk about the concepts of uh, historical trauma, the reason why we go back to this is it's going to make some sense when we talk about why is it that there's so much um, distrust, there's so much, um, uh, I guess, um, feelings of not being able to connect with other people when we're talking about, you know, re-entry and, and people are telling us what to do. And so when we go back to thinking about the, uh, the, the theory of, of um, historical trauma, it comes in three phases. So when we t go back in our, in our history, and this is just a real brief history lesson, it's talking about the dominant culture per per perpetuating uh, mass trauma on the population. And so there, is that when we talk about um, the forced relocations and so forth. The second phase of that is when we talk about the original generation of the population is responding to how that um, uh, historical trauma plays out within their own um, societies, um, on, on themselves as personally from a um, psychological and biological uh, perspective. And then the final phase, the third phase, is the initial, what the initial responses are to trauma are being conveyed to um, successive generations. And so when we talk about successive generations, that also results in cross-generational trauma. And so when we talk about the forced relocations, um, that was when we were, there was a forced assimilation of saying that um, Native, Native people in general had to assimilate to the, um, the culture of uh, Western society. And so that was done by removing not only families and children, but whole communities um, out of their uh, places of origin. And sometimes that was being re relocated to a completely different climate, a completely different ge geographical location and so forth. And so subsequent, subsequent to that, they also affected their uh, parenting styles and inadvertently started that, that um, cycle of violence and abuse. And so in that process, there was also some genocidal practices of, of things like that. Um, some of you are probably aware of the things like putting, you know, uh, unsafe sanitary conditions, uh, um, having long marches that were uh, kind of uh, sometimes referred to like uh, similar to the, the uh, abuses uh, of the Holocaust survivors. And so when we go on to the next um, slide, we're going to see the results of that historical trauma. And so when we talk about the socio, socio environmental part is that gender-based violence. That's when we see first the first signs of domestic violence and physical and sexual abuse. And what now we are seeing um, statistics that's three and a half times higher than the national average in Native American communities. And that may be actually low because not all assaults are being reported. 
And then also there's a proposed breakdown that occurs in Native American families due to the forced removal of Native American children, as can be seen for the reason of the high child abuse. And so when, when children were being taken out of their homes and um, put into uh, what we call the boarding school era time, there was a lot of um, children that were completely um, isolated from their families of origin. And that included um, uh, their way of life, their language, their customs, and, and so forth. And so that's where um, the reasons of um, violence, uh, domestic violence started to occur within the families. And then children are the most overrepresented group in this, in this area as well. And then also we're starting to see the uh, phys psychological piece of the substance abuse um, and suicide and, and past and present disruptions. Uh, we all, we all uh, are probably aware of that um, Native Americans have the highest weekly alcohol consumption of any ethnic group. And that studies have shown that uh, family disruptions and loss of ethnic identity places adolescents at a higher risk for that su um, high suicide rate and also higher risk for alcoholism and depression as well, including the suicide. And suicide rates among Native Americans are 3.2 times higher than the national average. When we think about the physio physiological pieces, right now there's a, um, uh, that many Native Americans use the services of the Indian Health Services. And so that's a, uh, just a general way of taking care of um, their, um, their health needs. Um, but when we look at the statistics there, there's also statistics of uh, traumatic stress that gets expressed in the families as a result, as they're talking about um, you know, their substance abuse or suicide or even their um, high diabetes rate, their high um, uh, heart rates, uh, their high, you know, uh, whatever other health disparities that may bring them into, into the health services. And so there's also that result of um, that perceived discrimination that comes about that when um, you've been living a life of this historical trauma as it relates to the, the families or the communities, there becomes an uh, eminent distrust of other um, societies, other people, um, about what seems to be best for us. So we we'll go on to the next slide. Um, we can see how then that there, you can start seeing that there's a difference of cultural perspectives. And if you remember at the beginning, we talked about how do we talk about this and, and who, and do we talk about it as a restorative uh, topic or do we talk about it as a punitive topic. And so part of that is in the way that we talk about or, or make our language known. And so that goes back to how um, most Native Americans or, or people in Indian country talk about themselves in, in terms of their worldview. And so this is just a very um, kind of a black and white. It's not always this clear, but it, it'll kind of give you an, an idea of the differences in ways that somebody may see the same problem from a different perspective. And so their worldview for a non-Indian is very linear. And as for an, a Native American, or um, it's very holistic, meaning it, it encompasses just more than what are the basic facts. And so, and culturally, and that um, means that only that which is necessary. So sometimes when you when a person comes in to ask for assistance or talk about the problem, they may not uh, disclose everything that there is, or they may make connections that for somebody that's uh, um, non uh, unfamiliar to the ways that they speak, um, may not think about those things and they're more concerned about, you know, the materialistic reasons, you know, what, how does this affect your job? Um, how does the suicide affect your, you know, uh, loss of income? You know, those kinds of things. And also the values are different for, um, non-Indians are very individualistic. Most Native Americans are uh, very communal. And so it's not un un unheard of when you talk about reentry um, that a caseworker may um, have to host a whole family uh, into their offices to talk about one person's reentry process. And so usually when you make an appointment for, um, you know, John Doe or, or Sally, Sally Smith or, or whomever, you expect just that person to show up. Uh, for Native American communities, that may mean, uh, you know, 
their aunts, their uncles, their grandmothers, you know, the elders in their community, whomever else that feel connected to that. And that's that communal base that, that goes along with the way that we talk about our problems. And also, um, uh, when we think about behavior, it's very egocentric um, as opposed to reciprocal. And so when we talk about ourselves, we never, sometimes it's very hard for a person to say I or me. And so when they're talking about their problems, those are some, some things that they, uh, that you have to look for and think about, about hearing because a lot of times when they don't say I or myself or me, there's sometimes a, um, a misunderstanding that the person is, is not taking responsibility for their crimes. Or rather, they may say we or, or us or um, they, um, those kinds of things. And so, and then going back to identity, um, when you talk about being an, an American, um, for us, we think about in terms of our tribal uh, affiliations. And so uh, we think about maybe in terms of uh, what community we come from, what nation that we, we uh, um, are a member of, and sometimes even the clan relations and, and those things are important. So when we talk to one another or talk to the um, Western society, our, our ways that we communicate with one another or address each other is very important. And also the communication style that um, non-Indians are more talkative. They're, they're, they're very um, forthright in what they, they want or they need. Um, whereas uh, most native people are more um, content with saying, okay, let me hear what you have to say before I speak, say anything. And sometimes that, again, that can be misinterpreted as either being disinterested or, or maybe uh, from a base of not knowing or not knowledgeable. And so when we think about um, talking about reentry, the cultural perspective is, is again, uh, very um, important from the differences of communication styles or uh, a worldview and so forth. Can we go on to the next slide. When we think about um, what is Indian country. So when we talk about Indian country, it covers a lot of area in terms of uh, we have right now at the most 567 federally recognized tribes and it, every year we have many more um, communities or nations that are applying for um, recognition um, and i think just recently we had i think one or two more that were added this year and so that um, landscape changes uh, uh, drastically in, in some cases and we've taken a snapshot of what is Arizona because most of our native um, populations are in the southwest area. But just as an example, to look at the state of Arizona, you can see how um, Navajo Nation, which is a, a big part of the Arizona um, landscape, is the largest and is compar comparable, compar comparable to West Virginia. And that, um, and that and we co and it covers over 90 square 90,000 square miles of tribal land. And as you look at um, the, um, the, the, the size of the Navajo Nation, it also then goes back to how, how do we think about um, jurisdiction as it crosses not only state lines, but also covers uh, county and district and, and so forth areas. So we, that becomes a big um, uh, problem that we need to think about as we address um, the uh, terms of jurisdiction. So we go on to the next slide. And so this is where um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to really bring into the, the, into the uh, conversation was about um, the, the uh, survivors of uh, sexual violence. And this is where I'll, I'll um, let uh, Megan take over. Right, so you know, most of the time when we talk about uh, crimes occurring, people wanna know what happened and it's, sort of backwards when, we, when we're talking about uh, crimes that are occurring on tribal land, because instead of asking what happened, they try and figure out whose problem it is first. Um, and this is a, a quote from the field that gives you a really kind of good overview of what this looks like and how backwards it can be. Um, in terms of public safety and governments. So for the tribal governments, um, they only, they have a degree of sovereignty. Um, they are technically a subsidiary of the US federal government, um, but they're considered formalized territories and the original reason for that was strictly to preserve native cultures. It wasn't until further down the line that there was this recognition that 
hey, perhaps these tribal governments should be able to um, have some sort of jurisdiction over criminal and civil matters, and that that was necessary to, to reinforce and protect their culture and their way of life um, and themselves. So of those 567 recognized tribes, roughly half of those have what we would consider a formal government. Um, and only about um, one to 200 of those have what we would consider a formalized uh, Western style court system. Um, beyond that, what, what the tribes actually have jurisdiction over varies dramatically. So they generally have civil jurisdiction um, over anything that's happening on uh, nation's land. However, uh, that looks really, really different when we start to talk about criminal jurisdiction and what types of crimes are committed and where and by whom. Uh, before we actually jump into all of that, just a quick aside about law enforcement um, on tribal land. As mentioned, Nan mentioned a minute ago, um, Indian country is about 90,000 square miles and within the U.S. It's all over the place and it's in a lot of like primarily rural areas. You're, you're looking at in most of these areas, you have about 1.2 million uh, residents of Indian country and what it equates to when you look at law enforcement, that ends up being about 1.2 police officers for every 500 tribal residents. That is completely different than what we would see um, in like a major US city. Um, additionally, you have a massive amount of land that's being patrolled by a very small number of understaffed and underfunded police departments um, that don't have very limited reciprocity with the state and federal governments. Meaning if somebody you know steps across a roadway or steps across you know a bridge all of a sudden they're the if they even if they've been in like a high-speed car chase or something that at that extent those officers that have been pursuing that individual no longer have jurisdiction they can't arrest um, and that's still very much the case so focusing on jurisdiction when you're talking about Indian country you're talking about potentially three different jurisdictions or more. So it could be federal, it could be state, it could be tribal. Um, and if I were to go back to the map that we looked at of Arizona, you would notice that even within the tribal jurisdictions, there's sometimes a couple of different tribes within spaces. So within the Navajo Nation, you also saw in the middle of the Navajo Nation, you saw the Hopi, you saw potentially a couple of other tribes. So it gets really confusing and really complicated because obviously the, these lines aren't drawn in the sand. You can't see when you cross over them. Um, so what actually determines who has jurisdiction in these cases? So physically where it occurs, right? Is it Indian country? Is it not? That's going to be the first question. The second is going to be, who, what, is the, what are the identities of the victims and the offenders? Um, largely speaking, uh, tribes do not have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. And there are exceptions to that, and we'll get to that in a moment. But the identity of the offenders matters and the victims matter greatly. If you have a crime committed by a non-Indian um, against a non-Indian, even if it's on tribal land, that is not under tribal jurisdiction. Um, the tribe is not able to police that. The type of crime is also important. There are certain crimes which are always and under all circumstances federal, um, but they may also be concurrent with the tribe. Um, some, depending on the state where it occurred, uh, different crimes may fall under uh, the purview of the state um, or the tribe or the state and the tribe. Uh, location matters. And it's, it's hard to give examples because it varies so greatly across all of the states. Um, in, a, in addition, so as I, I mentioned, even if you have an area that is potentially um, belonging to an entire tribe, it, it could actually look more like a checkerboard if you're talking about whether or not there's criminal jurisdiction. Um, even something that's considered Indian country, even something that's considered tribal lands may only be considered tribal lands for the purposes of things like taxation and not necessarily for criminal jurisdiction. So you have to be very, very careful and very specific um, in terms of figuring out who is actually in charge of overseeing what's happening. Um, that said, also concurrent Concurrent jurisdiction is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but like I, I mentioned a moment ago, 
the states and the the states and the tribal governments may not work very well together. They may not. They may have little to no communication on a regular basis, and that's largely the rule. Um, so you don't necessarily have them communicating very effectively over who's in charge of making something's happening, who is letting somebody know that um, a member of a tribe is being charged uh, in a in a different court. And you don't necessarily have the, the sharing of the resources and the sharing of the evidence. And so it gets really tricky in these cases to actually make sure that stuff sticks. So what does that end up meaning for reentry? Uh, to give you all an idea, with so more than 30% of uh, inmates in, third, in Indian country jails are there for violent offenses. And that is incredibly high. Because of the, the jurisdictional issues and the lack of reciprocity, we see, as well as all the, the cultural issues that Nan was talking about earlier, we see much, much higher rates of violence and specifically uh, domestic and sexual violence happening on tribal lands than we would within um, the rest of the American population. Um, it, it's, it's seen as a place where crime can be committed without there being really any effect. Um, very few, and most of most of this violent crime that's being committed is being committed by individuals who are non-Indian. Um, we know that statistically. So if we're talking about um, rates of domestic violence on tribal lands, more than um, more than half of Native American women in the United States have experienced some form of domestic violence in their lifetime. Of those individuals, more than ninety percent of the offenders were non-Indian. Um, and until very recently, tribes had really no ability to prosecute these crimes. These crimes. Um, additionally, because of the very little resources that many of the tribes have, or the the, the size um, of of the tribes, they may not have the resources to actually uh, try individuals themselves, even if they have jurisdiction. And even if they do, those individuals are likely to be jailed if they have, are serving time for over a year in some sort of federal facility. And most federal facilities are going to be pretty far away uh, from the tribes themselves. And they're, once they're in the federal system, the, the amount of communication that's happening with the tribes is incredibly, incredibly limited if it exists at all. Um, and so we're, we're left with this piece of, we know that there are a lot of people who are going into these systems, um, but we don't always know where they're going. And, that, and we don't always know when they're coming back. And that makes it really, really difficult to try and do what the things that we know are best practices in reentry, trying to coordinate housing and transportation and employment and recovery and making sure that people are in effective programs. And that becomes very, very tricky when we're talking about also trying to make sure that people are still tied to their families and their culture um, and that their way of life is being respected. So in the last 10 years, uh, there's been some major changes in in jurisdiction um, for tribes, an increase in sovereignty and an increase in their ability to actually deal with some of the violent crime that's been happening um, in Indian country. So the first big um, piece of legislation that we talk about, and this is an incredibly complicated piece of legislation, I'm only going to pick a couple of things out of there that, that are really relevant, um, is the Tribal Law and Order Act that passed in 2010. So previous to this, um, the Indian Civil Rights Act limited the amount of time um, that uh, tribal courts could prosecute someone for. So even if somebody was prosecuted for a violent felony, the maximum sentence they could receive would be a year in prison and a $5,000 fine. What this piece of legislation says, um, and you'll hear most people refer to the Enhanced Sentencing Authority. For the first time, the tribes can now um, prosecute for three years in prison and up to a $15,000 fine. And this is actually stackable um, up to about nine years. So you see a significant increase in the type of sentencing um, that the tribes are able to do. Um, what this also means is that you have a greater risk, uh, you have a greater number of high-risk offenders going on to community supervision because they're now being on, through the tribal governments because they're being prosecuted by the tribal governments. So 
them being able to prosecute more does mean that there's a lot more people coming in, um, reentering uh, from the tribal governments and under the authority of tribal probation and parole for the first time. Um, TLOA also mandates and uh, funds a number uh, of means of better coordination between the tribal governments and the federal government. It doesn't affect state rela relations, but it creates a fairly complex system of cross deputization um, and coordination uh, between the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, um, and law enforcement on tribal lands. And so for the first time, a lot of these individuals are sharing information. Um, they're able to prosecute locally. They're able to gather evidence and do everything on a local level, whereas before that was being sent up to um, the, the regional federal courthouses. So that's, that's also increased vastly the number of people that are being prosecuted and going into the system. Uh, the second piece of legislation is the Violence Against Women Act. Um, the 2013 reauthorization of VAWA allows for the crimes of domestic violence, dating violence, and violations of protective orders to be prosecuted by tribal governments for the first time. Um, specifically, it means that they can try non-Indian offenders for crimes like dating and domestic violence. And while this is very limited and it only covers a couple, a couple of crimes, we've seen a significant amount of um, prosecution um, happening on this level. Uh, and it's been a, a really, really important change in legislation for the tribes. The problem, however, <laughs> is that both, with both VAWA and uh, TLOA, the tribes have to do a significant amount of um, infrastructural work in order to be eligible uh, to implement and uh, use these prosecution authority. And it's only a few tribes that have really been able to take advantage of the rewrites of the laws. So Dan's going to help me out with this, but we want to give you guys an example of what we're talking about because we realize we've thrown a lot of information at all of you and specifically a lot of just sort of legal jargon that can be really confusing. And so we just want to walk through what would happen um, in a particular case uh, with an offender. So in, in this individual, uh, the offender is a non-Indian who lives and works on tribal land. He's married to and has children with a tribal member. Um, the individual was prosecuted and is currently incarcerated in a federal facility out of state and is to be released on parole. It's a VAWA crime, so we know it's a, a domestic violence dispute of some sort. Um, and the tribe that this individual is going to be returning to doesn't have a formal court or community supervision system. So everything has happened on the federal level. Um, but we can assume a few things uh, happening in this case. More than likely, this individual is returning to the family um, in the, in, on tribal lands. Um, as far as we know from this case study, he's still married. Um, still has custody of his children, and will likely be returning to the community. And we can guess that there is not, they're probably not going to be told when the individual is going to be released um, and where and where from. So they may have had very little, if any, communication with the offender while they were incarcerated. Uh, Nan, you want to jump in? Yeah, and so when we're talking about this case, some of the things that we would like for you to think about are um, in the ways that when we're looking at this is um, at this at this case example, when we're looking at that, going back to those questions of saying who who is at the table and how do we talk about this and those kinds of things, what are some of the things that you would think about as we're talking about this reentry plan for this person? What are some of the things that you would think about in terms of putting this case together for yourself? So one of the things would be maybe the resources and and um, services that are needed. What kinds of, uh, what, what do they have? If they don't have a formal court or community supervision system, then what are, the, what are your um, go-to things that, that you would then have to think about? And that requires, as kind of Megan had alluded to earlier, saying you have to think outside the box when you're working within, within these kinds of con constructs. And also, who is responsible for securing these services when we, or resources? When we're talking about cross-jurisdictional issues, 
everybody kind of says, okay, we know that this person needs help, but now um, who's going to take responsibility in terms of who's going to be the one that's going to follow up on this case, who's going to be the one that's going to fund um, the, the person's reentry resources, and those kinds of things. And so when we're talking about juris cross-jurisdictional issues, like, like we had talked about in our example of the Navajo Nation, then you're talking about um, having to be able to communicate with very many people along that line. And also, who, is to, who's that, who needs to be at the table that is not? Um, when I had talked about earlier about the cultural perspective of the ways that we talk about um, reentry, sometimes that may include a whole community. But a lot of times when we're talking about uh, resources, they're not prepared to talk to the whole family. They're, talk, they're, they're thinking in terms of only the uh, person that is, um, in this case, the offender that is returning, re-entering the community. And so we're also having to think about who is not at the table. Are the tribal elders at the table? Are the, uh, is the family, uh, extended family at the table? Because in our community of, of Native people, um, when there is a violence done against a family member, it, it means family in the sense of clan relations or extended family beyond just the nuclear family that um, most times we think about. And also who, if anyone, needs to be informed of the person's reentry and who is responsible at that point. As you know, that when we talk about the, incar and the, um, the prison system and, the, and when they're incarcerated, when they're taken into that system, they do not necessarily have to um, disclose what nation that they belong to. And so they can be, say, general, general population of saying, I'm Native American or I am. Um, but not necessarily of what tribe or uh, what from what nation that they or what lodge that they um, uh, think of as home. And so when we think about those kinds of things, when they are released back into those communities, it is not uncommon for the communities not to be even aware that this person is being released because there's no information. There's a communication break breakdown and also there's not that information for anyone to disclose that this person comes from your community. Mm -hmm. And so some of the um, roles that we talk about in this uh, case example that we'll have to think about are, is, um, are how are tribal elders and would be, how would they be involved? Uh, if you were a tribal elder, what, how would you look at this case and what would your, um, what would, would, you, would your perspective be on how to handle this case? Also, would there be a federal judge because we're talking about a, um, if you're talking being, uh, you are incarcerated in a federal facility, there was a federal judge at some point involved in this case. So therefore, that means there's also a federal probation officer that may be assigned to this particular case. Then we also have the victim's family, um, the person that he is married to and the children that he has with this particular tribal member. And also the victim services coordinators. Um, when we're talking about him returning to the tribal land, what are those resources, um, especially if there's uh, no, no formal court or community supervision system, who then takes responsibility and how do we pull those resources together? And also that there's the federal prison reentry counselor that is um, getting them prepared to go back into their community. Um, who, who are those people, who are the people that he should all, he or she should be in communication with or setting up meetings with or sharing resources with? Megan? Right. Um, you know, additionally, w one thing to think about, so obviously this, this individual has a federal probation, probation officer, and very often their territories are absolutely massive, especially when you're talking about the, these sort of rural areas. Um, and one of the abilities that we have um, after the, the Tribal Law and Order Act goes into effect is instead of that federal PO who might be a one day's drive minimum, um, from the home where this person's returning to, instead of that person being responsible for ensuring that that, that individual is, is doing everything that they need to do and that the victim um, safety is being upheld, they're able now to, to cross deputize. So they're able now to assign some of those um, probation or parole responsibilities to um, a, a local government or tribal member. And so that makes it all the more important for um, you know the federal or state actors to have a relationship with these tribal elders um, or the the tribal governments that are in place, so that you can really use those local resources 
effectively um, because we know that you know the closer and the more intimate relationship that um, they have with the with supervision, the, the better they're going to do. And so it's really thinking of not just what have we always done and what do you logically think of, oh, their federal PO is in charge of that, but we have to think a little more efficiently and we need to think from a stronger, more culturally centered perspective to make sure that the needs are actually being met of this specific group. Um, so going on, so some of the, the takeaways Jurisdiction is very complicated, and we've we've only given you guys a real small snapshot of what that looks like. There's an infinite number of uh, of examples and um, can, <laughs> ways that this can be confusing, both on the ground and from the the sky high level that we've given you. But the big things that we want everyone to think about when they're when they're going back into the field is, you know, what are the non-Western traditional ways that we can think of um, solving some of these problems. Who needs to be at the table? Who's not automatically at the table? How do we honor and respect the cultural perspective um, of the individuals that we're working with um, to promote the best possible outcomes for, for our clients um, and the, the families and the, the victims of some of these crimes? How do we do this in a way that is, is truly impactful? Um, so, uh, despite asking a lot of questions, there are a few really good examples um, of some groups that are, are working towards making some of these issues a little bit uh, easier to deal with. So, we do have uh, some tribes that are working, some um, federal areas um, and, and state courts that are partnering with, with the local tribes and the local tribal governments to create more restorative or holistic options within uh, the formal court process. Um, and so it, what that usually means is that there's a lot more, almost like a specialized court in a couple of places in the same way that we would think about, you know, a drug court or a veterans court where there's, the, where the, the judge um, is much more hands-on, much more responsive, and especially sort of trained and knowledgeable about the population that they're working with. And they may be working directly in conjunction with a, um, a tribal court, or there are even a couple of examples where there's, um, the court actually has a judge from both the, the, the US state or federal um, and the, the tribal government together in a single courtroom. Um, but a lot of it is programming, and Nan, I'm gonna ask you to jump in and give some better examples here, because there's programming that's starting to happen both during incarceration that really sets people up for better success once they're released. I know you can speak to that a little bit better than I can. Okay, so when some of the things that I know that are, are occurring within the, um, the prison systems themselves are ways that I think that there are more um, groups that are reaching out to not only one another, but within the system to say, how do we maintain our cultural identity as a part of this process as we work toward um, balancing our lives back into our own communities? And that, again, that whole perspective is, is relating back to saying, how do we um, come back home as a way of, as I, as I had um, heard many, many people that I've worked with saying, I want to go home. So when we're talking about home, it doesn't just encompass their individual person that goes back to their community, but what all that encompasses. And so the ways that I know that some of the um, systems are working is, is doing um, holistic ceremonies within the system to, to prepare them um, and then engaging the families at that at that process to be able to say they can come in and, and visit and, and come in and do sweats with them, come in and do uh, uh, some sort of healing ceremonies. And also that bridge gets um, crossed over as they return into their communities. And that's why it's really important, I think, when we're talking about who is still at the table and who should be at the table is the community leaders and the community elders for whom this is very important to bring balance into their communities and balance back to this family as they're trying to come back to some restoration of peace and healing for themselves. 
And so when we think about the um, consistent and respectful ways that, uh, that uh, Megan had talked about and, and being respectful of not only the culture that we're dealing with, but also being respectful of all the, the different ways in which we talk about um, re-entry or res restoration in terms of not only the um, perpetrator, but also the, the victim and, and in the case example that we had, the families as a, as a whole, how do we treat them as a whole and how do we bring them back together so that there's some semblance of balance and harmony back in their own lives, thus balance and harmony back into the, um, the lives of the community from which they're, um, they have left and also are returning back to. And also some of the other things that I think that um, we're talking about the um, ways I think that um, Megan had talked about is that you know the different types of courts that are being uh, that have evolved as, as a result of this process you know the peacemaking courts and um, you know uh, uh, the wellness courts and, and those kinds of things I think that has been a lot of uh, credit been due to the uh, Native um, communities and the collaboration of many people to bring forth a more um, culturally respectful way of dealing with um, the, as we have already um, identified, a very complex and a very um, uh, an intriguing way of, of having to take one person back into the community, which is much more um, complicated and, and occurs on very many different levels. And I think that, you know, part of what we wanted to do today is to be able to say, in a small way, kind of like what Megan said, is to kind of give you a glimpse into many different things. And for sure, we have not, in the time that we've had, um, been able to touch on all the different ways or all the different um, um, elements to what is a huge collaborative network that you're going to have to learn how to build and, and that we are slowly building. And I think many of us that work in this um, in this area are constantly doing every day of saying, wow, how can we better network the system, how can we better talk to one another, and um, how do we um, make sure that we're not dropping someone, you know, in the process and, and being able to hand them over um, to the next person and, and that person being able to do that um, with all the support and all the resources that they need at their, at their disposal. And in this day and age, as we are talked about, you know, when we're talking about large areas with very few resources, very few law enforcement, very few probation officers, very few judges, um, that can be um, seen insurmountable of a, of a challenge. But, uh, um, but one of the things that we keep working on every day is just saying, you know, if I can't do this work in my own little area by myself, and it's time that I need to start looking um, outside of those walls and, and start learning to bridge those gaps and being very innovative and very, um, very uh, courageous to be able to do those, uh, uh, seeking out those resources and, and reaching out. Because I think that a lot of, many of the people that, um, that are in that re-entry process, those that have come out on the other side and that have had, um, you know, peacemakers or had you know, sweat lodges or had, um, you know, judges that cared about them and followed up with them have always come back and said, you know, thank you, because, you know, this has been a long journey for me as well. And, and, it, and, it, and it's, um, it's helpful to know that, that people are there listening. And when we go back to um, the very beginning of the piece that about the historical trauma, that is part of the healing process, I think, that we need to make it's a journey that comes in, in cycles or in a circular way that where we begin, then that's where we end. And, and that's kind of where um, I think we look at reentry in terms of uh, tribal communities, that there's a, there's a beginning, but there's really, that's, it almost comes back to that same journey that we, we all have to travel and, and uh, the many people that we bring along with us on that journey. So, Megan? Yeah. So. This is just the start of a conversation, uh, really. And so we want to make sure that you guys have a lot of resources, um, but we also want to leave a lot of time for questions. So first and foremost, um, additional resources to follow up on. APPA um, has been doing a lot of work in this area for quite a while, and we're, you know, and Nan's really the person to talk to about how we're really expanding the types of resources and conversations that we're having here. But just a brief overview. Um, 
online, we have the Tribal Probation and Parole Support Center. And this is where we keep all of the, the webinars and the publications, as well as a lot of legislative and policy samples um, that can be used by uh, tribal governments, tribal probation and parole officers, or uh, state and federal uh, officers that work with this population closely. Uh, the Tribal Probation Academy, um, we currently have one that's full, <laughs> um, but we'll have a, a second uh, set in the fall for the Tribal Probation Academy that actually does um, three one-week training sessions for tribal probation officers. Um, at each of our uh, biannual training institutes, we have a tribal issues committee that meets regularly to sort of discuss where organizationally um, we're going to really be working uh, in this area. So that said, I want to open it up for questions. Uh, if any of you do have questions, please type it into the chat box um, in the bottom right hand of your screen, and we'll try to use the rest of this time to, to dig in a little bit deeper where you all see fit. Okay. Trying to make sure that I can properly view these questions, so. Sorry, hold on, everybody. Can everyone still okay, hear? I have, a, I have a question that says, will you be sending out a copy of this PowerPoint? And um, that's from, and yes, we will be not sending a copy of it, but we will have the talking points available that will be uploaded later on. So um, that you'll have the major points that we covered in, the, in, this, um, in this session. Okay. Then the second question is, what aspect of cultural connections do you think is the hardest difference to overcome? That's a really great question. Um, uh, I think that it all varies. And what we gave in terms of uh, examples of um, differences in tribal and, and native communities versus uh, the main, main society is, is just kind of a very, um, a very stark representation of, of, of one or the other, kind of a black and white. And so in that mixture, there, it goes from um, very different ways of, of ways that you can think about the, the different cultural perspectives, because you also have to think about the perpetrator that we didn't talk about that much, that in our case, that, that was a non-Indian. But even if they were native, sometimes they're not in that place where they are culturally connected. And I've seen um, uh, perpetrators that have entered the system that have had no ties to their cultural community. Um, but in the process of their own, um, their own, I guess, self-discovery or self-reflection of, of what, what their state of life is now while they're incarcerated, many go back to uh, trying to reconnect with tribal communities and from their cultural perspective. And so um, those are uh, ways that um, this, that question can take many different, different ways. So it's not an easy and or answer. So we have another question. Um, do you have suggestions as to who should be at the table? So what do you, what do you think, Nan? Um, definitely, I think that the more people there are, I think um, when you look at your own communities, um, I would challenge you to say, you know, if I were, um, you know, that person, who would I want in the room with me? And oftentimes that's going back to the um, perpetrator themselves or the victim themselves and saying, you know what? What? Who did you want in the room with you? Um, who do you, who would you, who do you think that will um, be helpful to you in this journey that you're having to take? And um, sometimes they can give you insight as to how they see their own community as a support, or 
um, who they look to as a support. And uh, a lot of times that may be some, somebody that we may have never even thought of or that they had in, inside information as, um, and that goes back to um, that uh, element of distrust of um, that I talked about when I was talking about the historical trauma, that there's a, a sense of um, not only perceived discrimination, but as a, as a result of that, the distrust that, that emanates as a result of, of that um, perceived discrimination of saying, I'm not sure if I can trust who you are or, or what you have to give me because you've told me a lot of things, but um, not, not many of those things have always been in my favor. So um, there's gonna be a, a wait and see. And so establishing that rapport with that person to be able to say, um, to be, give you to give you some insight into um, who they would like beyond who they already see in the room. And so that can include um, healers, which I already talked about tribal elders, people, maybe they know of a um, peacemaker court that would be willing to send somebody to, even though it's not on, in their community, send someone in. Um, having someone as a, um, a spokesperson for the family at large that um, may be involved a lot of times, um, especially in, in instances of domestic violence. There's, um, as we all know, that there's also some divide even within the family of how to um, talk about the problem or, or how to um, solve the problem. And so, and then we also think about the children. Um, we talked about um, how, what kinds of resources are available for the children as, as they're going through this. From a communal pr perspective, um, children are very much at the, at the heart of the conversation as to how, how do we take care of them so that they don't grow up in the same way and, and how do we break that cycle. And I think that's a lot of, that goes on in the literature. And so um, even though they may not know exactly what's going on, I think they still have to have some representation at the table as well. All right, so next question. Are there any uh, mapping tools that you can look at to help our tribe understand processes for different situations? So unfortunately, most of the, the mapping that I've seen has been from a, you know, I, a, a top-down perspective, so from a national perspective. To, to know what, I, what I'm guessing the, the question's asking is knowing, okay, which lands belong to who and all that kind of has to be done at a local level. And so that would be really a question um, to talk to that tribe and that state to kind of figure out. Um, but to my, to my knowledge, you'll see a few maps in the resources uh, that we link to, and, but mainly it's, it's a lot of articles sort of talking through how you determine jurisdiction. Um, it really has to be done at a hyper-local level, unfortunately. Uh, the next question. What aspect of cultural perspectives do you think is the hardest difference to overcome? Is it culture, values, communication style, or something else? What do you think, Nan? I think it's a comment. I'm gonna just kind of keep deferring to, I think it's a combination of all of those things. It depends on, on, wh on who you are in that conversation. I think um, as a non-native person that, that, it, that it is from a, a cultural perspective of like how I said, how do you talk? Um, how do you listen? And um, what are some of the signs that you normally interpret as one way should you be now expanding your worldview to say that this isn't maybe not something that I'm I'm uh, I'm used to experiencing from this perspective so if somebody comes into your office and, and um, seems to not take responsibility just because of their language of the way that they use their pronouns or nouns um, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not taking responsibility but maybe they're talking about themselves from the communal sense more so um, so for that, I would I would think about that. What evidence-based programs have been explored? Uh, DV, MRT, and Thinking for a Change, et cetera. Uh, so again, Nan, jump in if, if you have more on this, but to my knowledge, um, I don't know that a lot of what we think of as the evidence-based programs have been specifically um, verified <laughs> with this population. 
right? There's a, a lot of resources that go into um, making sure that something's evidence-based and has been specifically uh, tested in those spaces. Uh, so I think that the evidence that we have now as far as what is generally evidence-based with probation or parole, that's, you know, that's what that is. Um, but from a cultural level, my, my feeling is that there's not a lot uh, that's been specifically verified for that population. Nan, and think? again, that, and yeah, and then that goes back to what we had talked about earlier that even though we have statistics that are available for um, this population, those, those statistics overwhelmingly are um, underreported. Uh, and we know that because of, uh, of what we're seeing in our communities as a, as a uh, result of, of these, um, of these uh, circumstances. And so when we talk about, you know, evidence-based um, uh, studies or statistics or outcomes for any of the research that is being done, it's really difficult, I think, and even for Megan and I, as we were researching in, in this area, it's been very hard for us to find uh, resources that are updated or have current statistics and that's only because that this population is often overlooked in, in many ways as as to um, how to not only um, gain their trust to be able to come in and, and do some of this research but also by the um, the uh, individuals themselves that they don't self-report they don't keep statistics on it they don't um, track that um, and, and for communities that are under sourced and uh, under or uh, have very few resources. It's um, hard for them to keep to keep those kinds of um, uh, numbers on hand. Uh, so we have an individual who's a tribal member um, wanting to attend uh, the tribal probation academy. We will reach out to you afterwards um, and get you that information. Uh, the last question I have here, and please keep them coming if you have them. Will the tribal courts that are established now be utilized? Yes, is the, the easy answer to that. Um, the more complicated answer is the tribal courts look different from uh, tribe to tribe. So every single court, you know, part of the beauty of the hyperlocalization and is that tribes that have been able to put courts together have been able to make it the way that they see fit. They really had the opportunity to make something that, you know, either continuing traditions or building something for their particular community. That doesn't always look like a Western model. That doesn't look like necessarily what we think of as a, you know, any town USA courthouse with any town USA police officers and, and all of that. It can, but it doesn't always. And so when we're talking about the, the courts that are forming now, um, especially to be able to use the increased sovereignty that you get from um, enhanced sentencing and from VAWA, those have specific um, U.S. constitutional requirements in order for that sovereignty to be extended. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I don't have a, a graph really lining up what all that looks like, but to give you an idea of what that looks like is that in order to have that, that prosecution capacity you have to have, um, you have to provide uh, a public defender uh, for someone who's indigent in any case that uh, would require more than a year of jail time. You have to have judges that are presiding that have some sort of formal legal training by Western standards. Um, you have to be able to provide certain other uh, resources and constitutional protections. You have to have the ability to um, record and provide transcripts um, of all court proceedings. You have to have a jury of peers for the individual being prosecuted. So things that we kind of take for granted and, and don't really think about, but could be very difficult in some of these really small rural jurisdictions um, and that actually require a lot of monetary <laughs> Um, resources in order to implement on on a wide scale. And so you're seeing some um, really creative troubleshooting happening on the ground in terms of figuring out how can tribes really have control over their space and, and take advantage of this while also meeting the requirements under those two regulations. 
Um, are there any collaborative models between county, state, federal, and tribal governments in place that have successful reentry tactics in place that other jurisdictions might be able to adopt? Um, yes. The, the, the clearest one that I can think of off the top of my head is the Leech Lake Ojibwe uh, tribe in, I believe it's Minnesota. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nan. Um, and so what, what's actually happened in that particular jurisdiction, and I can include the, the information on that uh, when we send everything out, it's, a, it's actually a, a dual court where the, the local county judge um, sits and shares a courtroom with a, a tribal court judge. And the two of them oversee all of the cases together and in collaboration. And so it's this hyper-local response to a hyper-local problem um, but it's been very effective for them so far. And there are a few really good academic articles kind of detailing the way that that collaboration has worked out. What's difficult about those collaborations is that they're very dependent on the personalities that start them. Um, and so there's this question that comes up around sustainability. But I would say in terms of a, a really good um, state and tribal collaboration, that's one of the better ones I've seen. You have, uh, any others you can think of off the top of your head, Nan? No, that's what that, well, you know, when we talked about that, and I know that you and I have had that conversation, that's the only one that I can really think of, like you said, for all those reasons. I think a lot of um, tribes are, you know, work together constantly, and they're always um, looking at ways to not only expand their own um, ways to incorporate what other ideas that other courts have that have worked for them. And again, it goes back to the individual work on, on a more communal level that, that occurs. And so some of those things may be already in action and, and being put to use, but um, we, we don't hear of it until it becomes um, more widespread and more known. And so I know some of the, even the smaller courts are trying to incorporate, you know, different ways of um, uh, looking at, at the problem and, and trying to incorporate thinking outside of the box kind of thing. And I think that goes a lot to, again, um, spreading out their resources and, and collaboration work. Right. Um, additionally, under TLOA, there's a requirement that there be a special U.S. attorney within every federal jurisdiction that is required to be a tribal liaison. Um, so how effective these individuals are and the level of communication that they have with the tribes is obviously going to vary. but know that that person is there and that their job is to communicate with the tribes regarding people that are being prosecuted and that are coming home. So, you know, if you're, if you're on here and you're from, um, you know, a tribal government and you don't have close communication with this person, that would be a really good place to start. Um, so then the next question we have, and I think this is going to be the last one we take, was the enhanced sentencing primarily for domestic violence or any offense that the tribe identifies? Um, so it's any enhanced sentencing, um, was, was something that was put out before the domestic violence laws changed. So this is for any laws. The main requirements with enhanced sentencing is that it either has to be an offense that has been repeated. It has to be a repeat offense or it has to be something that would be considered a felony in a you know, in another jurisdiction. So if the state considers what happened to be a felony, if the federal government considers what happened to be a felony, that case is then eligible for the enhanced sentencing. So it, it has to meet similar criteria that it would in another court system. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, and we will be having uh, these particular types of webinars monthly. Um, the third Thursday of every month. Um, and it'll be a variety of speakers with different expertise. So I definitely encourage y'all to keep an eye out for um, the, the links to, to register for, for those. Anne? Thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate your um, participation and also your questions. All right, thank you.